Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the nitrosoureas as anti-cancer chemotherapeutics. Okay, so we're in the process of looking at the uh, cellular response to DNA damage. So we've discussed how the nitrosoureas are going to result in these inter- and intrastrand crosslinks within the DNA. And that's going to activate the ataxia telangiectasia mutated protein and also the ataxia telangiectasia and RAD free related protein. They are kinase enzymes, and when they become activated, so I'll denote them in this red color here, when they become activated, they are going to add phosphate groups onto other kinase enzymes, uh, which are the checkpoint kinase 1 enzyme and also the checkpoint kinase 2 enzyme. So, what's going to happen now is that checkpoint kinase 1 and checkpoint kinase 2 are going to phosphorylate the uh, protein P53. And by the way, this group sticking off up here, this is supposed to represent the phosphate group that's been added on by ATM or ATR. So, let's just discuss P53. So, let's say here is the protein P53. Basically, Usually what happens is the cell is continually making P53, but it also makes another protein known as MDM2. Okay, and MDM2 catalyzes, well, sorry, firstly, MDM2 binds to P53, okay, uh, the instant that P53 is made. So as soon as you make P53, MDM2 will bind to P53, and what it then does is, firstly, this initial binding will stop the function of P53. So that's how it initially inhibits it, but it's going to basically add insult to injury. It, well, actually, almost it's add injury to insult, the other way around, actually. Um, because at the moment it's insulted P53, it's just stopped it from doing its job. Uh, but now it's actually going to start catalyzing the addition of uh, ubiquitin groups onto P53. So it's basically going to result in the ubiquitination of P53. So I shouldn't actually draw that in a circle because I've just told you that circles are how I denote phosphate groups. So I'll draw it as a square instead. So basically you're going to add ubiquitin groups onto P53. So this is a ubiquitin group. Okay. So once the MDM2 has bound to the P53, it then helps with the addition of ubiquitin groups. And then this is going to target P53 for destruction by the proteasome. Okay, so over here is the proteasome. And the proteasome basically is a machine which breaks uh, proteins down into little fragments of amino acids. So uh, this complex is now going to go into the proteasome uh, well, it's going to feed P53, and P53 will gradually unravel as it's being fed in, and it will be chopped into loads of pieces. Okay, so that's how you stop P53 from becoming active in a normal resting cell. Now, what's going to happen is when you activate the checkpoint kinase 1-2, what these are going to do are when you initially make the P53, so the P53 has just come out, what you're going to do now is it's going to be phosphorylated by the checkpoint kinase 1 or 2. So they're going to add a phosphate group onto the P53. And what this phosphate group is going to do is it's going to stop the um, MDM2 from being able to bind to the P53. So the P53 escapes the binding of MDM2 and it escapes the destruction. And what it is then going to do is it's going to act as a transcription factor. So it's going to go to the nucleus of the cell here. So here's the DNA within the nucleus of the cell. And it's going to bind to the promoter region of loads of genes. Now, it doesn't do this alone. It actually assembles into a tetramer in order to act as a transcription factor. So here comes our P53 tetramer. So this tetramer of P53 uh, proteins, and this is going to bind to the promoter region here of a bunch of genes. So in eukaryotic cells, upstream of all genes, you have a promoter region, um, which isn't responsible for being coded itself. So it's not part of the 
um, genetic code. It won't actually be uh, incorporated into the protein structure, but it controls the expression of the downstream genes. So in turquoise is the gene, upstream of the gene is the promoter region. Okay, now, basically, in order for the gene to actually be expressed, in order to actually make the gene product associated with this gene, you need the RNA polymerase enzyme to bind uh, to the DNA, open the DNA up, and start making the mRNA. So, um, basically, the promoter region is the portion where RNA polymerase binds to, opens the DNA up, and then starts working its way along the gene to make the mRNA for the gene. Now, if you a promoter, um, sorry, a, a transcription factor is something which will bind to the promoter region and alter the affinity of the promoter region for the RNA polymerase. So, what these p53 tetramers are going to do. So this is a P53 tetramer, is they are going to bind to the promoter regions of certain genes and increase the affinity of RNA polymerase for binding to those genes and therefore increase the expression of those genes. So what sort of genes is P53 going to increase the expression of? Well, basically, it's firstly going to increase the expression of the proteins involved in DNA repair, which makes sense. So it's going to try and repair the damage to the DNA. It's also going to give rise to proteins which are going to halt the cell cycle. So cell cycle stoppers, basically. Cell cycle um, inhibitors. Okay, so it's going to stop the cell from being able to divide. Um, and it's also, if things go really badly, so if P53 levels are high for a very long time, um, that will indicate to the cell that basically the DNA repair is just not getting better. And of course, it's not going to get better in the case when you're taking chemotherapy because the cell is continually receiving more nitrosourea drug molecules. So it will continuously be getting new um, inter and intra strand crosslinks being formed. So it's continually going to get damaged DNA. So P53 is going to be continuously on. And basically, the cell will think that the DNA damage is just not repairable. So it will start to produce pro-apoptotic molecules. And P53 is responsible for increasing the expression of these pro-apoptotic molecules. So basically, uh, continuously forming these inter- and intra-strand crosslinks in the DNA can drive the cell through its p53 pathway into apoptosis, into committing suicide. So it can also actually cause cancer cells to commit suicide. This is, of course, assuming that cancer cells have a working p53 system. And, of course, you have to factor in the fact that 50% of all tumours have mutated p53. So this pathway is assuming that the p53 pathway is still intact. This is how it should work. But of course, cancer cells have this generally mutated anyway, so it may well not actually cause uh, the cancer cells to commit apoptosis. Okay, so now, finally, what I want to turn my attention to is that other molecule that was made uh, by uh, the nitrosourea. I want to turn my attention to this isocyanate uh, ion and what it's going to do. So we've discussed the 2 chloroethyl diazine hydroxide, which will uh, produce these inter- and intra-strand crosslinks. Now let's discuss the isocyanate molecule. Okay, so the isocyanate molecule. So you've got this carbon double bonded to the oxygen, double bonded to a nitrogen, and then bonded to an R group. And this is the isocyanate molecule. Well, basically, this is going to carbamoylate proteins. So let's say we have some arbitrary protein over here. And let's say this protein just happens to have a hydrogen atom somewhere. Okay, So anywhere in this protein where you have a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to something which is absolutely all over the place. Now, it will have to be bound to something reasonably interesting for this reaction to happen, but basically we're just going to say this is a generic covalent bond to a hydrogen. Now, what can basically happen is uh, you can cleave 
Um, so what's going to happen is you're going to cleave this bond between the protein and the hydrogen. You're also going to cleave this bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. What you're then going to do is bind this carbon to the protein and then bind this hydrogen to the nitrogen. So what you're going to go to is you'll have the protein here and then attached to it what you'll have is the carbon with its double bond to the oxygen, the nitrogen here now singly bonded to it, the nitrogen is bound to the hydrogen and then also to the R group. So basically we've uh, cleaved this bond here and if you like what you can think about happening, although it won't happen this way, but just to keep track of this in your head, you can think about one of the electrons going back to the carbon, one going back to the nitrogen. This cleaving here, one goes back over here, one goes to the hydrogen. The hydrogen's then going to use its electron to bind it with the nitrogen here to make this single bond. And then the carbon's going to use its electron, and the protein will use its electron to basically make this structure here. And this here is known as a carbamoyl group. Okay, so this is a carbamoyl group. And this process of adding carbamoyl groups on is known as carbamoylation, which is a truly fantastic word. Carbamoylation. So basically, we say that nitrosourea drugs also carbamoylate proteins. Now, do you think this is good for the protein, having these groups added onto it? No. This is going to happen all over the protein, and it's going to lead to dysfunction of the proteins. Now, this is probably one of the actually main ways that nitrosoureas are cytotoxic. They're going to cover your proteins in carbamoyl groups, causing dysfunction, and this is basically just horrible for the cell. It's going to cause cell death. Cytotoxicity. So, this is probably a very important mechanism by which nitrosoureas actually kill cells. Now, you can see that this isn't specific to cancer cells whatsoever, really. This is just going to kill any old cell it comes across. So, these are pretty foul drugs, but they are clinically used to treat cancer. Um, so, carnosine, lomustine, sumustine, and streptozotocin. They are the nitrosoureas used in anti-cancer chemotherapy.